Mm -hmm. You guys are doing, you're killing it. I think so too. I was saying that to Ariel beforehand is that I've loved all of the um, student interaction and sort of just having the students be a part of it. And I thought the conversation with uh, the Congressman yesterday was really great. Yeah. I thought the questions that were posed were just incredibly thoughtful and um, yeah, it seems like Colorado's got good things happening. Yeah, I love how you had the uh, girl from the community college there as well to really balance things out. And man, I'm surprised to not see as much of CSU Pueblo uh, involved in this conference. So that's going to change next year. I'll make sure of it. Because we're sort of, you know, the little university, uh, you know, people call us like the Mexico of Colorado. Uh, and, and so I think it's important for us to be present in, in all the conferences, especially inside Colorado where pe people may not know us as well, or may have different perceptions of us, I guess. Well, everybody's serious now. Just gonna test this real quick to make sure our uh, event coordinator can hear me. All right, guys, thanks so much for joining us for Colt Day 2. Um, here's our first presentation. I'll hand it over to Jonathan to do the introduction. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And if we have time to answer them at the end, we will. Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Jonathan. I'm, uh, I know many people here in Colorado. Um, I, it is my delight to introduce the speaker this morning in this wonderful plenary session. Um, I should mention before I get started that I am um, uh, speaking to you from 
the traditional unceded land territory of the Ute peoples, um, uh, earliest documented people in the area where I live also included the Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne. Um, the main speaker this morning is Amanda Coolidge, who is the director of open education at BC campus in British Columbia, Canada. She leads the province's initiatives in open education from open textbooks to open pedagogy with a team of nine other people who work across British Columbia and enhance access for students. I, I had the pleasure of meeting Amanda, my first in-person open education conference several, several years ago in Vancouver, and it was really, really mind expanding. So my head is several sizes larger than it was before I met her, and I've had the pleasure of hearing her at other conferences since then. She is going to pass off um, uh, late in her presentation a little bit of time to uh, my colleague, Dr. Alegria Ribadanera, um, for an example of the kind of things that Amanda is talking about. So let me just mention, Dr. Alegria Ribadanera is a distinguished professor and director of world languages at Colorado State University Pueblo. Um, she is involved in natural in heritage language teaching and um, she was a recent recipient of the OE Global Global Educator Award. So, um, Please take it away, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And I'm really grateful to be here today. So I'd like to start by talking about reconciliation. So reconciliation is about establishing and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. In order for that to happen, there has to be an awareness of the past acknowledgement of the harm that's been inflicted, atonement for the causes and action to change behavior. And in this process, we acknowledge, acknowledge the land on which we are situated and we give thankful respect to that land and its peoples. In our acknowledgement, we do not just pay tribute to the past, but we acknowledge our collective place and responsibility for the future. So my name is Amanda Coolidge. My ancestors come from England, Ireland, and Scotland, and were uninvited settlers of the Mi'kmaq, Nipmuc Nations and the Wabanaki Confederacy, also known as Prince Edward Island and Massachusetts. I learned on the Mi'kmaq, Blackfoot, Nakota, Sutina, and Métis Nations, also known as Nova Scotia and Calgary, Alberta. I've worked on the Mi'kmaq, Blackfoot, Nakota, Sutina, Métis Nations, Kenya, and the Musqueam and Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, also known as Calgary, Nova Scotia, and Vancouver. I currently work on the unceded and stolen lands of the Wasanic and the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations of the Algonquin-speaking people, also known as Victoria, British Columbia. However, today I'm presenting to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, uh, the home of the people of the Epitwek, uh, also known as Prince Edward Island, Canada. So for those of you, if you're not sure which territory you, you reside on or perhaps where you work, you're welcome to take the time to look up uh, your own territory, the languages uh, that are spoken on that territory and the treaties in your region. And you can do so at native-land.ca. And once you've found your territory, go ahead and share the location with folks in the chat or on Twitter using the conference hashtag. So let's dig a little bit deeper into who I am. I'm a cisgender white woman. I'm a mother, a partner, a daughter, sister, friend, and colleague. I'm a fourth generation university graduate on my dad's side and a second generation university graduate on my mom's side. I'm Irish, Scottish, and English. And I grew up overseas in, and have lived in England, Poland, Pakistan, the United States, Canada, Kenya, and Guatemala. I'm active, um, I love the ocean, and I'm also an avid reader. My family and I live seven months of the year in our RV, and you can see my family here on the right-hand side um, and our RV behind me. <laughs> um, and my personal values include family, community, and connection. So my up upbringing taught me a few things, to be adaptable, to respect cultural differences, and that there's an extreme unfairness and a power to the privileged in our system. I strongly believe that sharing our narratives with each other and our lived experiences creates a caring and empathetic learning environment. It allows us to know where a person's values and thoughts come from and what influences have they experienced and how those influences are perhaps reflected in their learning and their worldviews. So today I'm the director of uh, open education at BC campus and I lead the open education initiatives across British Columbia, Canada. 
BC Campus has been working in open education since 2003, and we serve the entire province of British Columbia. Our role is to work with the 25 public post-secondary institutions across the province in the areas of educational technology, teaching and learning, and open education. We've been an organization now for about 18 years, and we're primarily funded through our Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Training, and Open Education has also received additional funding from the Hewlett Foundation. So before I dive further into the history of the work that BC Campus has engaged in with relation to open educational resources, I wanted to provide a definition in case this is the first time that you're hearing about open educational resources or OER, or perhaps you've heard of them before, but you just want a little bit of a refresher. So UNESCO uh, defines open educational resources as learning, teaching, and research resources that are available in any format and medium in the public domain or are under copyright that has been released under an open license, which then permits no cost access. It permits reuse, repurpose, adaptation, um, and redistribution by others. OER can be any type of learning resource. So textbooks, videos, course materials, lesson plans, game simulations, blog, wikis, test banks, and PowerPoint slide decks can all be considered OER as long as they're in the public domain or have an open license that allows them to be revised and repurposed by others. Open education is about sharing, collaboration, and breaking down barriers so to accessing education and knowledge. You'll often hear people talk about the five R's in open education, which is defined by David Wiley. And these R's stand for five rights that define open educational resources. So the first R is retain, and that's the right to make, own, and control copies of content. So for example, that means that the right for a student to retain access to their textbook long after a course has ended. The second R is reuse, which is the right to use the content in a wide range of ways. So for example, my slides are under a CC BY license, which gives you all the right to reuse these slides however you want. So you could take them and actually give this presentation tomorrow if you want. The third R is revise, which is the right to adapt, uh, adjust, modify, or alter the content content. So for example, if you have an open textbook that you'd like to use in your classroom, but there's a few chapters that you don't want and some of the information is out of date, you're able to go into that textbook and make those changes. The fourth R is remix, which is the right to combine materials together to create something new. So you could combine chapters from different open textbooks to create something that fits your needs or fits the needs of your students. So the final R is redistribute, which is the right to share copies of the original content, as well as any revisions or remixes you create. These five R's are enabled by open licenses and open licenses make it possible for the creator of a work to give everyone um, everywhere permission to use, share, edit, and redistribute part of their work without needing to ask first. So the open licenses that are used most often with educational materials are Creative Commons licenses. And there are six main Creative Commons licenses. Um, each license has a set of conditions that limit what people are allowed to do with the work. And these conditions are represented by a number of initialisms. So at BC campus, our open education work, as I said, began in 2003. And um, this is when we started distributing grants to faculty to create and share openly licensed courses. In 2012, our Minister of Advanced Education announced that the province of British Columbia would receive $1 million to support the development of open textbooks. And since that time, we've received another million dollars from the government. And we've also received $250,000 to create the first tuition-free and zero textbook cost program for adult bas basic education in North America. In April of 2019, we received $3 million, the largest investment in Canada toward making education accessible for all. So when our open textbook project began in 2012, we started with bringing in open textbooks from other collections. And we asked faculty to review these textbooks and we would incentivize them with a $250 
um, $250 for each review. On the left-hand side of the screen here, you can see an example of one of those reviews. As the reviews came back, there was a growing trend that indicated that uh, many of the reviewers would use the open textbooks, but they needed to be changed to include more Canadian examples and to be in better alignment with the learning outcomes of their BC courses. So we put a call out for adaptations and using Pressbooks as our publishing tool, we were able to work with faculty to adapt some of these open textbooks to meet their needs. On the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a screenshot of one of those books called Introduction to Chemistry, First Canadian Edition. So since 2012, British Columbia has saved students more than $26 million, impacted more than 220,000 students, and we have a growing open textbook collection of more than 300 books and guides for post-secondary education. Open education has a pivotal role to play in the unprecedented times of a pandemic. The pivot to online teaching and learning has brought to the fore profound inequities. And the inequities that existed before COVID-19 are heightened today more than ever before. Access and affordability are issues that are plaguing our student populations. So let's dig a little deeper into the why of OER. What benefits do they offer compared to traditional open educational, or sorry, traditional educational resources? And one of the biggest is the cost savings for students. Because OER are free online, instructors who adopt these can share the resources with their students free of charge. The cost of education and uh, living in Canada rises each year and every year students are going deeper into debt to pay for education. With the average student debt in Canada at about $25,000 to $30,000. In 2018, 64% of Canadians graduated with $20,000 or more in student loan debt. The average student loan debt in Colorado is $26,562. And cumulatively, Colorado borrowers owe $29.3 billion in federal and student loan portfolios. The high cost of education is one of the biggest things that discourages people from pursuing post-secondary education, and it plays a big factor for those who decide to drop out. In addition, more and more students are working in, um, while in school to pay for their education, while some even work multiple jobs. In 2017, we worked with researchers Rajiv Jongiani and Sarita Jongiani to put out a survey to ask students in British Columbia um, their perception of open textbooks. And one thing we found out was that 54% of students did not buy a textbook at least once due to cost. 27% of students took fewer courses because of the cost of textbooks. 26% didn't even reg uh, register for the particular course because of the cost of the book. And 17% actually had to withdraw or uh, drop out. In British Columbia, my colleague, Krista Lambert, has conducted research on classes that require access to homework systems or digital publisher resources and found that on average, students are paying about $92 per course for an access code. And similar findings were cited in a student in public interest research group um, report that said that the average cost of an access code sold solo, so that means not bundled with a textbook, was $100. Most recently, our research shows that if we look at one subject area at one small institution in British Columbia, the cost borne by students for an access code will add up quickly. So with about 1,700 students paying an aggregate total of about $140,000 in one single term. These access codes actually prevent access for our students. Internet connectivity is an issue that many of our students in our rural and remote communities contend with on a daily basis. Pre-COVID, there was the opportunity for students to use the Wi-Fi at McDonald's, at Starbucks, and the public library. And today, those access points are no longer available, or if they are available with the new Delta variant, it's possible that they may not be for long. So I bring this to your attention because this is where we need to find alternative solutions for accessing OER. While OER is free, if it's not available in multiple formats for our students, then access for the students become obsolete. And having something free that's not accessible, well, that's not really useful. 
so this is why at BC campus we created a print on demand guide for institutions. Another way that we're seeking um, alternative delivery formats to OER is through a pilot project where we're trialing out USB business cards with a condensed version of BC campuses open educational resource links and tips printed in the exterior. So these limited edition units are appearing in the hands of Northern and interior uh, post-secondary educators exploring OER. So I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to instructor Brad Bell. Brad has spent the last decade facilitating adult education and upgrading in remote, rural, and First Nation communities in Northern British Columbia. His experiences in these locations have had a profound effect on his pedagogy, specifically when considering rural education. We really need to be considering um, adaptability and access. So Brad knows that many people are rightly excited about uh, these materials that are both di digital and downloadable for students and instructors, and that they can be easily adopted for online course delivery. But these materials have been especially useful in the rural communities with spotty internet access where he teaches. In order to provide learning opportunities over such a large geographical area with very prominent and sometimes debilitating socioeconomic issues, much of the coursework only functions if the student is in charge of how and when they access the course materials. Until recently, providing upgrading courses at multiple outreach sites meant that the inside of Brad's car looked a little bit more like a storage unit than it did anything else. He facilitated several core courses as well as multiple electives, and therefore he had to transport copies of every textbook, novel, course packet, and supplementary resource that may be needed during an outreach session. And now all he needs to do with him is um, when he reaches out to different communities is use the USB drive um, that has BC campuses OER stored on it. And at first glance, this may not actually appear to be earth shattering, but for many of Brad's students it is. Textbook costs have always been a barrier for some of his students and only so many class copies of a given text can actually be stocked. So the open textbooks distributed through BC campus have been deciding factor for many students who would otherwise not enroll. Um, and the open textbooks have created a space for Brad so that he can provide students with copies of the materials they need to be successful and in any format they need. So access and affordability are paramount reasons on why open educational resources are needed in education, but they're not the only reason. So remember a few slides back, I talked about the Creative Commons licenses. Well, the benefit of the CC licenses means that the works with the CC license can be shared, edited, adapted, revised, reused and remixed. And all that to say that this means that OER provide the opportunity for the development of inclusive learning materials. Commercial textbooks can take about two to three years to be updated. And when those updates are made, they're not always inclusive of diverse lived experiences, nor do they contain the most up-to-date content. New America is a nonpartisan nonprofit in Washington, DC, and they've been writing a blog series to explore the um, possibilities for creating and implementing inclusive learning materials with the focus of leveraging OER. So Savia Prescott, who's one of the authors and policy analysts of this series says that LGBTQ students are never taught material that reflects, represents or validates their identity. And as a consequence, LGBTQ students are less engaged in school, they graduate at lower rates and they face much higher rate of mental health conditions than their non LGBTQ counterparts. So, Another example, in the first few weeks of virtual instruction in the fall of 2020, um, Christine Rockwell Bardlow, who's a high school uh, English teacher in New Jersey, tasked her students to develop class rules and norms. And then she set up, she then built them into a social contract. So Christine says, this is a time when I explicitly state my expectation that LGBTQ plus students and students who are members of traditionally marginalized populations will be seen and valued in my classroom. She also emphasizes the importance of students seeing themselves in the curriculum um, and in the material they're learning from. So she intentionally includes LGBTQ people in her lessons. Um, and by doing that, she's, she is showing 
the, and sending a message that LGBTQ people have positively impacted society, um, politics and culture. And so for students who are seeing that representation of themselves in these materials, that can promote better um, academic and mental health outcomes. So in British Columbia, instructor Chantal Yvetz um, was tasked with writing books for adult basic education English series through BC campus. Chantel wanted to reflect the diversity of learners in British Columbia, and they also wanted to respectfully include indigenous ways of knowing and being. Chantel really wanted it also to be made um, available for both self-paced and group delivery. An interesting thing that Chantel did was that she, they felt really strongly about making grammar exercises as interesting as possible. So Chantel took out a number of trivia books and she, they found fun and interesting facts to keep the learners engaged through humor. So one example that was used was, the Bible is the most shoplifted book in America and the students were tasked to identify the subject of the sentence and the subject being the Bible. Chantel also created a curriculum that challenged oppressive stereotypes. They shared various human rights issues and really strove to create a safe and respectful dialogue around topics such as anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, addictions, learning disabilities, homophobia, and colonization. Chantel took out a lot of books on how to incorporate Indigenous ways of knowing and being by Indigenous authors. And in the art above, Chantel hired a two-spirit Indigenous learner from one of their classes to illustrate their book. So this was a great opportunity for the student not only to share their own amazing illustrations, but also to have their work published. In addition, Chantel was very intentional in their biography at the end of the book to share their pronouns as they, them, and to identify themselves as queer transgender. The intention was that perhaps other learners may feel a sense of belonging by reading the biography. Another instructor, Christine Miller from Thompson Rivers University in Interior, British Columbia, adapted one of our human biology open textbooks. So she started with one of the textbooks from CK12, um, which was very heavy on American curriculum and it did not represent diverse learners. So Christine wanted to add specific local content. So she started with finding content relatable to interior British Columbia. And if not interior British Columbia, then for sure British Columbia. And if not British Columbia, then for sure Canada. So she went ahead and changed all the st statistics and case studies to be uh, British Columbia references. She also wanted to include elements of indigenization and respectful ways of representing ecology. She wanted the book to be accessible and to re represent multiple narratives of folks. So not just blonde, blue eyed, 20 something year olds. A lot of the artwork was changed um, and um, the, she changed photos and case studies to be reflective of the diversity of student population. On the left hand side of the screen is an example of a series of photos Christine changed to be somewhat diverse and to be really reflect a portion of the human population. As this was a course on human biology, Christine said she wanted to celebrate humanity and what humans actually look like. In addition, Christine wrote a chapter about local and traditional um, knowledge, and she included examples of traditional indigenous science knowledge and how that differs from Western scientific knowledge. The example shown on the right-hand side of the screen um, is where Christine shares some of the learnings from the Chequetmik territory where her university is located. Finally, Christine noticed that the photographs in her text did not include photographs of Indigenous students and ones that were Creative Commons licensed. So there was nothing available that had this diversity that she needed. So together with um, their university media production team, Christine is working with her Indigenous students to create a full set of photographs um, of her students that will be used and have Creative Commons licenses and will be available through a repository showing Indigenous students studying working together, and as seen in this example, um, laughing very hard when Christine actually um, bonked the camera on her forehead while she was taking the photo. So from access to affordability 
to inclusion, open educational resources have the power to transform student learning experiences. As Jess Mitchell of the Inclusive Design Research Center states, if we aren't designing for inclusion, then we are saying that we are comfortable with a certain population of people not being involved. It's important to start to ask your students about their lived experiences. Share your own narrative with your students in the hopes that they may share theirs with you. And pay attention to who and what is represented in your learning materials. And finally, leverage the power of open educational resources to enable access, affordability, and the creation and or adaptation of inclusive learning materials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should, should I help hand hand things over? So I think um, Amanda is handing over uh, to, for example, of some of the uh, inclusive kinds of pedagogy that she was um, motivating us for to to my colleague, Dr. Alegria Rabadinia. So, Alegria. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and oh my goodness, thank you so much, Amanda. I am just so thrilled to be presenting alongside you. Um, as I told you earlier, you are one of my open education heroes. And so it is wonderful to be here with you. And uh, what I will be doing today is uh, echoing a lot of what Amanda shared with you and focusing uh, on something that is closer to Colorado. And uh, I will be talking about open education, affordability and inclusion in a Spanish program at a Hispanic serving institution. As Jonathan say, said, we are from Colorado State University in Pueblo, which is a Hispanic serving institution. So in the time we have, I am going to share with you uh, a little bit about CSU Pueblo and our Spanish program. I am going to tell you what we are doing with open educational resources, what we are doing with open educational practices. I will share our current project that is super exciting, and I will invite you to follow our journey. So um, my town, Mi Pueblo, is called Pueblo. For those of you who don't know, that means town in Spanish, but it also means people, as in power to the people. <laughs> so the land that we sit on uh, was acquired by the United States in 1848 through the Tratado de Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, when um, the United States uh, after the Mexican-American War. So before that, it was Mexico. And before it was Mexico, it was Spain. And so we have a long history of Spanish in our area. And of course, before that, uh, it was, an, um, it, it was um, Apache, Comanche, Ute, as Jonathan was saying earlier. So um, the population here is about 112,000 people we're about 51% Hispanic and 23.5% uh, of the people in my city live in poverty. When we look at Colorado State University, uh, we are a um, regional comprehensive university with moderately selective admission standards. So about 95% of our students here are in some sort of financial aid. Also, 34% of our students are Hispanic, and about 40% of our students are first-generation students. Many of our students make use of a lot of the services we provide, such as our pack pantry, which um, tries to address food insecurity in our area. So as you can see, uh, we are really serving uh, um, a, a group that is underserved and underprivileged. And this is why, the vision of our university for 2028 is to establish Colorado State University as the People's University of the Southwest United States. And so we take this mission uh, very seriously because we want to serve the underserved. So open education addresses students' financial needs, as uh, Amanda was mentioning. But that is only part of the story, right? Uh, because open education can also 
address our students' lived experiences and focus on their pedagogical and effective needs so they can succeed in their learning. And the best example I can give you is that of the Spanish uh, program. So 80% of our majors are Hispanic and 70% of our minors are Hispanic. So when uh, you look at my students in my classes, you are going to find very diverse language acquisition backgrounds. You're going to have Sarah here uh, on the, I don't know, on your left, I think, where uh, she did not grow up speaking Spanish at home, though she did grow up in a city where a lot of Spanish is spoken. But uh, none, nobody in her family speaks Spanish, and she is trying to learn it from scratch and has gone uh, through the different classes to end up in my class. And then you have Daisy, and Daisy is, uh, came to the United States when she was 13 years old, and uh, because of uh, the um, eradication of bilingualism in our school system, she lost her home language and now is looking to regain it and also gain literacy skills that she lost along the way. And then you have Eddie, and he is fourth generation Mexican, and uh, he can remember his grandmother singing to him in Spanish, but his grandmother never taught Spanish to her children because she was afraid of discrimination. So now Eddie is in our classes trying to recuperate the language of his heritage. And so these are the typical students in our classes. And each student has a story and a point of view that we must address as teachers and a point of view that we can learn from as students. And I include stu the teachers as students here. So through open education, the teachers can bring awareness to the issues that affect our students' learning, both pedagogically and effectively. And then through open education, students can be empowered by teaching others about their perspectives and lived experiences that have not made it to the mainstream textbooks. So let's talk about Spanish open educational resources uh, at my uh, CSU Pueblo. Here is the thing. Most commercial textbooks focus on Spanish as a foreign language, but Spanish is not a foreign language to my students. It is the language of their home. It is the language of their city. And so when we create OER for my program, I want to address things like prestige and stigma in language varieties. I don't know if you all know, but the United States is the second largest Spanish speaking country in the world, but this is seldomly recognized in commercial textbooks where they actually favor what they call the standard variety. But the standard variety is the, um, the result of colonization and of power structures that have decided that this is the right Spanish and has stigmatized other flavors <laughs> or varieties of Spanish and had cert has certainly stigmatized language mixing, which is something that my students do quite a bit. A lot of my students have suffered language shaming, as you can see from this chart. And the language shaming comes from family, friends, teachers, and even strangers. And I want this to be addressed on our OER. And I also want our OER to celebrate their translanguaging, which is a very practical and valid way of communicating and also creating community amongst bilingual, bicultural people. And I want our OER to uh, delve into identity exploration and representation. Many of our students are living between languages and cultures. And as this student uh, wrote one time, he said, the bicultural life is interesting, but also difficult. It comes with lots of problems and laughter. Living in two worlds, I am always too American for my Hispanic culture, but too Hispanic to be American. I have the power to connect two worlds, but it is not easy. So when we are creating OER, we have a chance to choose even the places our students explore. So the typical commercial textbook is going to show you La Puerta del Sol in Madrid, which is wonderful, and I'd like to include that, but I also want to include Pueblo's Riverwalk. Also, textbooks help us choose the people people we meet. And so while commercial textbooks uh, are usually introduce us to Shakira, who I love, by the way, uh, she's Colombian, by the way, she is a brunette. She <laughs> dyes her hair blonde. <laughs> uh, I think, to, especially since she started singing and uh, transitioning 
to the United States market. Uh, but I want to include Selena. Selena is a Hispanic singer. Uh, she was a heritage speaker, and my students can truly identify with her. And in OER, I will also uh, have the opportunity to choose the pedagogical approach we take. So um, usually foreign languages are taught by giving people little pieces of language and then asking the students after they've gotten a lot of little pieces to build something with those pieces. But when students already bring some language into the classroom, what you wanna do is take a macro approach, which is asking them to build something and then with the pieces they have and then give them the pieces they need as they go along the way. So really um, honoring what they're bringing into the classroom. And this brings me to project-based learning. So uh, a lot of you probably know that project-based learning um, is an approach where students explore an issue and a problem for an extended period of time and then create a product with a real life purpose using real world processes, tools and quality standards. And their product makes an impact that, and is connected to their own concerns, interests and identity. So we use a lot of project-based learning in our program because it, it, it is a macro approach. But when we do that, we have an opportunity to create open educational practices. So with open educational practices, especially with our heritage language learners, our students can create, as part of their course, they can create materials to educate others, the general public or other students who can use these materials to gain new perspectives. Open educational practices can be transformative. They empower students to reflect on their unique life experiences and how their perspectives can contribute knowledge to the world beyond the classroom. Now, by interacting with materials created by heritage language learners, others can benefit from being exposed to perspectives of Spanish speakers in the United States because these perspectives are sorely missing in the general media and our traditional textbooks. So some of the authentic products that my students can create in order to teach others are things that we watch to learn, like informational videos, how-to videos, public service announcements, or things that we listen to in order to learn, like podcasts and audiobooks, or things that we read in order to learn, like books, brochures, infographics, textbooks, websites. And I want my students to create these materials for other people to learn. For example, they've created a music and society textbook uh, where they created 14 chapters, uh, things where they explored Latinos in the United States and music, and they explored mu protest music and the influence of Latinos there, and music of migration and how uh, music uh, portrays immigrants and traditions and celebrations from their own lived experiences. They have danced folklorico dancing. They have uh, been quinceañeras. So they have the authority to tell these stories and also explore their identities through music and show others how the bilingual and bicultural musical identity includes so many different um, items, for example, Los Pedernales, together with Pink Floyd, together with Pollito Pio, and together with Hakuna Matata. They have also created websites uh, to explore food and society and explore their identity and shared it with others in that way. And so you can meet Gabriel Dueñas, who tells us how uh, he is deeply connected to tortillas, frijoles, de la Rosa Mazapan, but also pizza and pumpkin pie. Or they can teach us about family recipes and community members and teach us how to uh, uh, do their recipes so we can cook. Or they can teach us about businesses in our community that are Hispanic, uh, create websites for those businesses and even commercials to advertise or they can share stories and histories, such as the children's books that they are writing, where they explore things like identity, how amazing it is to be bilingual, how people speak differently, uh, how beautiful diversity can be, 
and even migration stories through the lives of fish. Because, hey, if you can teach little children about these things, um, this is an amazing contribution we can do to learning. And they can also uh, share oral histories. For example, the oral histories that they did about the pandemic. Uh, you probably have heard that Hispanics uh, were disproportionately and are continue to be disproportionately affected by COVID. And so these are things that our students, that, that my students can share with the world in order to teach others. And of course, in doing so, uh, they are incredibly engaged and incredibly empowered because they can share their lived experiences and teach others and then see themselves reflected in a lot of these materials and uh, share it with everyone in their classes. When they reflect upon, uh, upon things that they've done, they say things like, uh, projects about my identity are magical. I think everybody needs uh, to do projects about their musical identity, or I learned that I am proud of my Mexican culture, or I think we can understand a lot about other people, even listening to the music that they listen to because music has such an important part of our, our identity. Or I realized that how my identity and that of my family affects and makes my identity even stronger. So now I wanna share with you our new exciting journey. We are embarking on a zero textbook cost initiative. This means that any student studying Spanish at my Hispanic serving institution of CSU Pueblo will never have to pay for a Spanish textbook again. And to me, this is huge. And I wanna share with you this journey because I think it's very, very exciting. Right now, uh, we have started uh, putting together some of the text OER that we've already produced, and then we have some others in, pro in progress. This will have um, beginner Spanish for our students that have has their lived experience reflected. It'll have second year, third year Spanish, and there is a section also for them, for our students' work, to be part of the materials for the instructors to use. But of course, this being OER, it will not only be for us, it'll be for you as well, for your classes. So you can bring in my students' voices into your classrooms and all these textbooks as well. So this is a very exciting journey that we are um, embarking in. And I invite you to follow us. It's gonna take a while, but uh, it'll be exciting to share it with all of you. And Amanda has already made such amazing contributions with her awesome accessibility toolkit. If you haven't seen it, I absolutely um, recommend it. But uh, this is going to be, I believe, life-changing for our students. Uh, and if you are thinking, maybe you want to do this, but oh my goodness, I'm so busy and there's so much to learn and really gulp, um, start small, start small because the rewards are incredible. The fact that you can empower your students, the fact that you can uh, prepare them to share their lived experiences to the world and come into the world with all this knowledge and feeling empowered that they have a voice in the world can be so, um, so amazing for our society. Uh, so I invite you to do it and to dare to be an OER hero. I wanna thank you for this time. And uh, I don't know if we have uh, any time. I think we have a little, a few minutes for questions or comments. So um, maybe we can do that. Thank you. Great. I'll so we'll wait a moment as questions are coming in over the hub, and I think that Ariel was going to cross post them into the place that we can see them. Amanda, did you have your hand raised in your own presentation? No, to say no, no. Oh no. 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 Okay. Um, let me just. Um, there was a question on the hub earlier, which just to to make sure everyone saw that there was a question about whether the BC campus. Um, all of the textbooks on BC campus are accessible, or only ones that are marked as such. And I think um, Steele Wexeth must have jumped in and said that it was the 
the ones that are marked in particular and um and uh, Amanda confirmed that there are yes, ones that are particularly correct. marked that are the ones that are most accessible. Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking Alegria how you can be reached. <laughs> oh, just type Alegria CSU Pueblo. <laughs> and I will pop right up. But um, I also have a website. It's with Alegria.net. So uh, you can reach me through there. But you can find me through CSU Pueblo. I would love to share more of this and of course um, hear what everybody else is doing because I think we have an amazing opportunity to be sharing. That's what it's all about, right? Maybe I, can ask, maybe I can ask a question just, just while we're waiting for things to transfer in from the put chat, chat on the hub and over here to our platform. Um, to Amanda, you, you, you were talking about how the difficulties of access and um, I think I, I was just wondering um, the, the, a lot of the wonderful things that are happening are very, seem to be very kind of multimedia and interactive textbooks are really exciting these days. And I was wondering how do you balance the kind of needs to um, you know, your colleague you described who travels around with this car with all those resources in his car, how, how does he, or how do you vision the future of open education that wants to reach this very diverse audience, some of whom have difficulties with access? How do you ima imagine that balancing with the wonders of electronic and interactive yeah. textbooks? That's a great point. So that's something that we're actually looking into right now, which is called our offline OER project. And one of the things um, that we're extremely passionate about is trying to ensure that we do not lose those interactivities or any type of um, extra multi multimedia or video or other ways to actually access some of that material, specifically because of our um, real drive to make sure that we're supporting multiple styles of learners and multi representing learners as they should be. So there's a few things that we're doing right now. So like one example is um, we're looking at ways to do offline EPUB um, publication. So we'd be able to, to deliver it through that. Another thing is to um, do our very best to um, create audio versions of some of the books where we know that the students are accessing um, the books in those rural and remote areas. So for example, right now, all of our beginner trades books all have an audio component to them. Um, and so they're, they're with a MP3 recording of the, the book. And then we're working on doing that with our adult basic education books. Um, but, you know, I think it's a challenge that open educational resource advocates across the world are struggling with. And so it's important for us to figure out, you know, what do we need to do with, um, with our governments or with um, institutions to be able to provide either low cost tablets where we can put the materials already on an offline format for students, because that's the other thing too, at the, you know, they may, we may be able to offer an online offline version, but then they still need, you know, this format in order to access it. So it's something we're working on. I would encourage people, if you're interested in this topic, to reach out to me, but also to keep informed through our BC campus site. Great. Maybe uh, so a question that was cross-posted, I guess, from the, the hub, hub was, um, both of you talked about localizing or personalizing material for learners' needs. Can you tell us more about indigenizing or making more culturally responsive teaching materials and how OER fits into your work in these areas? Um, uh, that, that is such an amazing question because, um, you know, in, in the Spanish-speaking world, a lot of us are mestizos. We're mixed, right? The Spaniards came, the French came, um, the indigenous populations mixed, and we are mestizos. When you watch telenovelas and when you look at textbooks, everybody's white, right? So just even looking at the pictures, like Amanda was saying, and um, including Afro-Latinos, mestizos, indigenous populations that have all, that also now speak Spanish is a very important thing for representation. And going a step further, a lot of the Spanish language has indigenous words in it. Just think of aguacate and chocolate, which I know you know, you, I know you all love chocolate. And all these words came into our language. So you have to pay homage to that. You have to make it clear to students that the language and the culture is all intermixed 
with our indigenous populations in the Spanish speaking world and also speak about colonization, you know, mm -hmm. and Spain and Latin America. Uh, these are uh, topics that are important for us to understand where we are today and where are we going. I'm not, I would be happy to answer that question, but I also don't know about the time with, we're coming up to the time, so I don't want to, I'll. I don't know either. Why don't you take a okay. quick, okay, sure. a quick answer, we so can wrap things, things up. Yeah, so one of the things that's really important if you're looking at ways to indigenize your curriculum is really to create relationship with indigenous people. So if there is an indigenous scholar at your institution or perhaps a community member who you can reach out to who has traditional medicine knowledge, for example, if you're working on a biology open textbook or has examples that they'd like to share um, that aren't necessarily, uh, we're, we're not going into, um, you, you know, you don't want to be taking stories from indigenous people to share that aren't uh, allowed to. But I think one of the things that we've done with BC Campus is we've created those relationships with um, our indigenous uh, educators and we have asked for their um, support in, in writing some of this work and obviously paying for that work as well. Um, the other thing I think to do, and this kind of goes to Alegria's point is, it is so important as when you're writing curriculum or um, any materials, I think the first thing to do is once you've done your first draft of something is to stop and just say, who, who have I left out here, mm -hmm. right? Who is not being represented in this? I mean, the thing that we need to also recognize is that history has always been told by the side of the colonizers. And so we have not had the opportunity to hear from our, um, our uh, community members who, you know, are rightly so have been affected by colonization and what that means. And so I think that's another thing is we constantly begin to sort of question and just pause before hitting send and, and really thinking about, am I acknowledging others within this space? And um, also think about sort of your own, um, you know, your own biases in this. Um, Thank awesome. you so much. Well, I, think we, I think we need to wrap up now. Okay, I see Ariel. Yeah. <laughs> yes, guys. Thank you so much. You guys will be getting some high praises from the hub. If any attendees would like to connect, I've added both of you guys to the Slack channel. Um, and then you guys can also catch Amanda later today. She'll be hosting a workshop at 1130 Mountain Time.